television relies on your financial support. Become a sustaining member today. You're watching West Virginia Public Broadcasting. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Learn more at aarp.org wv. The Charleston Gazette Mail, using its CGM app to deliver the latest news, traffic, and weather alerts, keeping you in the know while you're on the go. Lumos Networks, online at lumosnetworks.com. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. Orion Strategies, professional public relations, government affairs, creative services, and research and polling, with offices in Charleston, Buchanan, Martinsburg, Pittsburgh, and Columbus. Welcome to the Legislature Today, I'm Suzanne Higgins. An inflammatory poster displayed outside of the House chambers by participants of West Virginia GOP Day here at the Capitol launched a firestorm of remarks in the House of Delegates this morning. The poster shows a picture of Congresswoman Omar of Minnesota, a Somali American. The background shows the Twin Towers attack. Just as the Speaker of the House called the body to order, Delegate Mike Pushkin stood and launched what would be a series of remarks. Democrats condemning hate speech while Republicans defending freedom of speech. Walking uh, into the chamber today, and I, I realize that it's uh, you know, West Virginia Republican Party Day, and that party day today, and that's great. Okay, I'm also the member of a political party, and that's wonderful too. And I, I'm gonna try not to make this partisan, but as as part of the display out there, there's a there's a poster um, with a uh, picture of uh, the planes flying into the uh, to the twin towers of, uh, in New York on 9/11, and 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 underneath there's a picture of a sitting member of Congress, uh, Representative Omar, I believe from Minnesota. Um, I find it distasteful. Uh, I, I said so. I went over and, and spoke with the people at that booth that I believe is sanctioned by a political party. They're out there with them. And I, I, I expressed uh, my disgust about something like that that really, I believe, points out a, uh, a, a, a hatred and a mistrust of somebody because of their religious background, because of their religion. Because uh, that congresswoman isn't from, isn't even, she's not from Saudi Arabia, she's from Somalia. She entered this country uh, through a refugee program. And I can tell you that personally, I'm proud to live in a country where somebody can come into this, to come into this country with absolutely nothing and, and wind up in, in the halls of Congress representing the state of Minnesota. That makes me proud to be an American. My issue with what I saw outside has to do with another truly American foundational issue, and that's freedom of speech. So while I may not agree with everything that is out there, I do agree that freedom of speech is something that we have to protect, even if we don't agree with it, maybe especially when we don't agree with it. There are times when people in this chamber, my dear friends, my colleagues, will get up and say something that I fundamentally completely disagree with. But if you ask me, well, 
Will I fight to make sure that they have the right to stand up and do that? Oh yes, with every breath in my body. Absolutely I will. And I'll do it just as hard for something I don't agree with as I, as I will for something that I happen to personally share that belief. So I'd like to ask the members of the body, when you see something that you disagree with, Please don't respond in the way that I unfortunately saw with my own eyes, where you call the people names that I'm not going to repeat in here, where you barge through the door and hit the doorkeeper, which I also saw with my own eyes while the pledge is going on, because you're understandably upset. Well, I agree with the general lady from the 38th. We have freedom of speech, and that's something we have to respect. Let me explain to you something that we experienced just a short while ago. I walk out of the chambers and I see a discussion going on with Delegate Pushkin and a lady with a display, which was reprehensible. But like the general lady said, she has her freedom of speech and I respect that. And while I was talking with Delegate Pushkin and I said, let's, you're not going to change her views. Come on, let's get, let's get back inside. The Sergeant of Arms of this body had enough nerve to say to us, all Muslims are terrorists. The sergeant of arms of this body that represents the people of the state of West Virginia said all Muslims are terrorists. That's beyond shameful. And that's not freedom of speech. That's hate speech. I'm the one who kicked the door open. That's how angry I was. And I went over to that poster and I said it was a racist poster. That was me. I owned that. I'll own that because that's what I believe. I tried to get in here between the prayer and the pledge, and I'm a member of this house, and no one's going to keep me from opening that door. But the point I'm trying to get to, I have always preached to freshman delegates, and people who've left this body got up and said, Mike Caputo taught me not to make it personal. When it gets personal with me, it's bad. It's bad. There's no place in these halls for the crap that's going on out there. Freedom of speech is very dear and, and near to me. Let's hold it all within the House. And Mr. Speaker, we got lots to do today. Let's move on to Montana. I would fight for anybody's right in here to say whatever they want, no matter how stupid it is. I believe in the freedom of speech with every ounce of me. I'm a strong some supporter of the First Amendment, and I would never ask somebody to take something down. I rose to condemn it. And I would hope you would, too. Join us now are Brad McElhaney of West Virginia Metro News and our own senior reporter, Dave Mistich. Thank you both for being here. Those, of course, were the remarks on the floor, but the story got larger, Dave, uh, regarding the West Virginia uh, Sergeant of Arms. That's right. So uh, as you heard Delegate Caputo talk about you know, him being kept from being in, but the, the, the real story, it seemed that uh, at least uh, Delegate Angelucci uh, said that, that um, the Sergeant at Arms and Lieberman had made some comment about how all Muslims were terrorists. Um, of course, Brad and I were sitting on the House floor, did not see these interactions. Um, whenever I came out of the House, I asked the Sergeant at Arms. She disputed that account, um, but said she didn't want to talk to, to media until she had spoken to the, the House Speaker, Roger Hanshaw. Uh, Brad, it was, it was very uncomfortable in the House. Yeah, it was not at all what I was expecting because I had seen the, the broader uh, display, meaning that it was it was GOP day. So mm -hmm. there were big posters of President Trump, Trump Pence posters, uh, some images of the governor, Governor Justice, uh, some images and, and things with the Republican Party taking pride in other elected officials in West Virginia. That's what I saw when I looked around the rotunda. I did not zero in on this display, but it was this context of, of everything else celebrating the Republican Party in West Virginia. Uh, and then within it was this reprehensible display. Uh, and, and so it not only was the display itself, but, but the context surrounding it, including uh, the speeches that were made on the House floor and the fallout that has continued throughout the day. And then, of course, um, the speaker did come out with a, a statement later today. That's right. I mean, he, he said very clearly he, he condemned any kind of hate speech um, in all forms uh, and rejects hate in all forms is exactly what he said. 
uh, had said that there was going to be an investigation into exactly what played out before the floor session uh, involving the sergeant in arms, other delegates, and any comments that were made out there in the rotunda. Um, and that's sort of where the speaker had left things. And, and it just seems, Brad, that um, in the House, there, uh, all session long, there's been this somewhat of an undercurrent, a, a sensitivity to, the, to this particular, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, inflammatory speech. Uh, there were accusations later of, of racist legislation. Um, it's, it's just been at the boiling point. You know, we're getting late in the session and, and people are afraid anyway. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. The context is also what, what's been happening all session long and, and the, the tempers began to arise with the comments of Delegate Editor Eric Porterfield, a new delegate from Mercer County, uh, who said some awful things about... Um, uh, the LGBTQT. Yeah, the, the, the gay community. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that really hasn't settled down. Uh, he has continued to serve both on the floor and in his committees. Uh, he's, he's been a little less outspoken. Uh, but as a result of that, a lot of the Democratic delegates were arising and trying to push for uh, changes to the state's human rights law uh, to, to acknowledge uh, sexual orientation and, and gender and um, uh, gender identity as parts of the human rights law that are protected. And, and those attempts just didn't go anywhere. So all this has been moving along until things reach the boiling point on the floor today. And, and Dave, not, um, not only that, but just looking for a reprimand from, from leadership, from party leadership somewhere. Right, and when the whole thing with Delegate Porterfield you know, popped up, uh, you know, there, there were Democrats, call, Democrats, even the party itself, as well as delegates on the floor calling for his resignation. Um, you know, and, and they made those motions to try to get that Human Rights Bill Act, uh, Human Rights Act uh, bill out to the floor. Um, that the West Virginia, you know, Republican Party had had denounced his comments, but as Brad pointed out, there were there were no real there was no real action from the speaker, no no reprimand, no punishment whatsoever. Um, this the statement you know that came today about the events you know on on before the House floor session and and whatnot, you know. I don't, and I can't recall a moment. Concerning to, the sergeant con, in arms. Yeah, concerning the sergeant in arms. I, I think this is the first time that the speaker has sort of addressed any of these issues himself. I mean, I, there was a day to where yourself and I and Jake Zuckerman sat outside the speaker's office at the heart of the whole Port De Delegate Porterfield controversy, and, and the speaker made no comment. So and I mean, actually, the statement from the speaker's office came probably within an hour after the close of session yeah, today. Yeah, it was really, really quick. The, the speaker also... Um, talk more generally in that statement about the incidents surrounding uh, the, the display. And one of those, as Delegate Caputo acknowledged in his floor speech, was kicking in uh, the, the door that leads into the chamber. Uh, the door is closed during the opening prayer and Pledge of Allegiance. And my understanding is there's some concern uh, about the health of a doorkeeper uh, who was maybe affected by the door opening. So all kinds of bad things happen today. All right. What we want to do now is, is, is pivot and turn to focus on the budget, the budget process. Um, as of now, Friday evening, we've got uh, both the finance committees have completed their version of next year's budget. The Senate budget is on second reading tomorrow, Saturday. Everybody, both houses are in. The House's budget is on third reading. Um, first, perhaps a, pr a procedural explanation as to why or how the, the House's budget takes lead this year. Either well, uh, the, the two houses kind of alternate, and it mm -hmm. just happens to be the House's year, but also uh, just procedurally, <laughs> each each finance committee passed out their budgets yesterday, but the House had an evening floor session that the Senate didn't, so they went ahead and did first reading in the House, so that just put them ever so slightly ahead. Uh, nevertheless, the two are going to come crashing together. Uh, there are major differences between the two budgets, so somehow the House and the Senate are going to have to resolve those major differences. And, and knowing that at this point, um, you know, the House's budget does not reflect uh, uh, bills that have passed the Senate, but they have not uh, taken that up yet. And most notably, the the, um, the the big road maintenance bill that we have termed Randy's dream after mm -hmm. Ran uh, Senator Randy Smith. And and so, 
I'm just trying to get a, a, a way to compare these. Let's, how about if we start with the governor's proposed budget on January 9th, some of his proposals, and then we can see where, where they might be, how they might have been um, cut or not included. Uh, the teacher's salary, there's, who has it? It's included in the House budget, correct? It, included in the House budget, and they passed that uh, straight pay raise bill, and the, the teacher and public service school service personnel part of that is about 67 million dollars if you're doing your budgeting at home and trying to figure out what do these things cost and so uh, uh, the, the in the senate's version they would have had to have moved on 2730 and that's still in two committees yeah not happened yet it, right. and it's possible it still could be moved on it's in senate education and senate finance but nothing yet Okay. Right. And we've heard a lot that this, I mean, at least I've heard that this could go to a special session. At least the teacher pay raise could be one of those issues that may not get completed in 60 days. Um, at least I'm hearing a lot of talk about whether or not the Senate's actually going to take up this bill. And if they do, I mean, we've heard all along there's questions about if they might try to tack on other things to it. So it may not be done in 60 days. The community and technical college bill, uh, where is it? It's, it? it's included in the Senate. It's not included in the House budget as of yet. Yeah, House Finance was taking that issue up this afternoon, but as they completed their budget work yesterday, uh, delegates amended in things that they thought their communities would want to have s supported more financially. And at the end of that budget session, they said, is there any more room for the community college bill? And they said, it's gonna be tight. Uh, so they were taking it up today and they may make arrangements for it even on the floor uh, on Saturday, but it's it, and that's it's seven million point. dollars, I think, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. About seven million, right? It's, it's, so that goes it's to not show, big, I think, big ticket, right? Yeah. It sort of illustrates, I guess, you know, uh, how such a small number, well, small relatively, rel relatively to a four point six billion dollar yes. budget, you know, how how seven million dollars can make an impact on the overall bottom line of what comes out. So, mm -hmm. but it's a Senate priority. So, if the House wants the Senate to move on some of their stuff. Right. You know, right. They'd have to do it. Right. The other thing I noticed too, and I just want to throw this out there, is that Jim's dream appears to be cut. That was my next both, question. Yeah. It, it's smaller. It was a $25 million ask, and it's, it's much smaller in both the House and Senate versions. Yeah, the House has it in the back of the budget, which means if we happen to have a surplus, we'll fund oh, Jim's dream. Okay. Uh, the Senate funds it at a smaller amount, but right. nevertheless, Jim's dream, not. Not, not a big dream. Not fully realized. <laughs> not a fully realized dream. What, um, and this would, this would be a, a hit on the um, general revenue, obviously, the Social Security income tax break. Um, is that reflected in, in either of the uh, It is in budgets? the House budget because it, it had been part of the governor's budget, and so they didn't make a big deal of it, but they said, yeah, we're going to do that, and they've passed the bill. Uh, the Senate, though, hasn't yet acted on that bill, and I'm not... Typically, the budget bill wouldn't deal with stuff they haven't passed mm -hmm. yet, so I don't think it's in there at the moment. Now, I, I, I believe the, the severance tax on um, steam coal, that, uh, that cut is reflected in the House budget, yes. not yet in the Senate. They haven't taken that. Have they taken that bill up? They have not yet. <laughs> That's no, that just passed yesterday. It's a yeah, two-year right. step down on steam coal severance Something tax. Something like 60 million. Yeah. 60 million over the two years, Jeez. so 30 million a year. So you put that with the teacher pay raise on the house side, those two things account for about $100 million, uh, which the Senate doesn't account for. Right. And um, we mentioned uh, Randy's, or we mentioned Randy's dream just uh, just briefly. That's, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a big, uh, that's a big uh, ticket item on the, the Senate side. 100 million? 110 million. million. So on the House side, you've got the teacher pay raises at 67 million, uh, one of the two years of tax cuts for 30 million, so 97 million, versus the highways plan, which is 110 million, uh, to, to patch secondary roads. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to argue to West Virginians, do you want your roads fixed or do you want your teachers to have a pay raise? Right. That's a bit, that's a big, um, it's a big difference, though, on the two sides, and also um, tourism. I saw, you know, the, the governor asked for 14 million uh, for the tourism division, and uh, both sides, I think, have have cut that down. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing, at least on the house side, where if there happens to be a surplus, they'll fully fund it, but they both cut it down. And and also, the uh, higher education is getting a little bit of help. It is getting a little bit of help, although higher education also faces some things that 
that are costs you might not realize. The campus carry bill said to be $11 million across yeah. the system. Right. Uh, the, the, the boost to PEIA for colleges is going to result in a fee that's going to be about $16 million they're going to have to pay uh, to, to make up for their part of the PEIA boost. Uh, so <laughs> they're getting a little bit, but they're also having a bunch taken away from them. Um, do we know that you know that fifty-three million dollar uh, supplemental appropriation to Medicaid? It was pretty quiet last uh, last week when it was approved uh, by the Senate Finance. How is that? You know, how is that seen, and where's that money? come from? Where's it going to? Medicaid money is often the yeah. magic money of the budget and it's used to kind of make Patch things holes, work out. Patch holes, move things from one, one, one year to another. What was explained in the House budget session, a similar amount they were going to prepay from the current year's surplus into next year's Medicaid fund and they were going to use that, that money to make up for exceeding the, the budgetary amount in right. other areas. Mm -hmm. So $50 million in, in money moving around to make up for other stuff. Any, anything else in your, you know, looking at the budget very quickly? I mean, this just, you know, both of those, uh, both of those bills just came out yesterday, last evening. Uh, anything else that stands out? I mean, I think we're waiting to see amendments. I mean, today the bill is on second reading in the House. They advanced it to third with the general right to amend. Likely, I think every budget that I've ever seen passed by a chamber has had some floor amendments. Um, I haven't seen anything in the system yet, but we'll see those tomorrow. Yeah, a, a, a Democratic delegate in House Finance said they were spending like sailors trying to amend in their own things. And then a Republican delegate, um, it was Jason Barrett was the Democrat, but Republican Jim Butler, also in finance, said he couldn't support the budget because there was so much amending in of other people's stuff. It'll, it'll just be interesting to see ultimately how much of that surplus they do commit um, you know, and a lot of worry already that forward. West Virginia's economy, although it's been improving, may be tapering off. Right. Any any sense as to who these conferees uh, w will be if it gets to you know conference committee, which certainly well, uh, normally you think, think the, the finance, finance chairs, chair, chairs, yeah. both from Martinsburg, yeah, so they know each other chairs. well. But I mean, I, I see no reason why the budget would not get a conference. I mean, I think it does yeah. virtually every year, so yeah. uh, I think we can expect that. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, it's going to bounce back and forth a few times probably, and that's where we're going to wind up. Okay, super. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Brad McElhaney of West Virginia Metro News. Thank you. Dave Mistich, thank you so much. West Virginia First Lady Kathy Justice helped kick off Women's History Month today with a celebration here at the Capitol. Randy Yowie reports. We're here to honor the women that came before us, the women who stand next to us, and the women who will be making history in the future. The celebration began by honoring five noted greats in West Virginia history, including labor activist Mother Jones, NASA mathematician Katherine Johnson, and old-time musician Hazel Dickens. But the list of Mountain State women who have made a mark, made a difference, goes on and on. Our country singer Kathy Mattea, and our actress Jennifer Gardner, we can't forget her, and uh, Mary Lou Retton, who was our great gymnastics. The Revolutionary War heroine Elizabeth Zane from Berkeley County. The Confederate spy during the American Civil War, Belle Boyd from Martinsburg. These West Virginia women didn't just excel, they inspired. It's ex especially important because I have a teenage daughter and her friends, and I'm always trying to get them to become aware of the fact that they are women and that they will meet various obstacles and that they will have certain challenges and that they need to be prepared for those before they come. Hello, my name is Crystal Good. I'm a liberal Republican, a conservative Democrat. I have libertarian tendencies and I love me a good mountain party. That's all you got. <laughs> Acclaimed West Virginia poet, writer, and activist Crystal Good has also helped shape the preparation for Nancy Klein's daughter and friend. It's preparation that also includes a West Virginia Women's Commission lead initiative, establishing gender equity on Mountain State boards, commissions, and in the legislature. 
They are ramping up a number of programs. Let me make sure I get it right. The Ready to Run training, Student Ambassadors program, and Women and Girls Day right here at the legislature. This, they're looking at state-appointed boards and commissions that have a political, social, and economic impact. They're especially taking a look and targeting the State Athletic Commission. That oversees all women's sports but doesn't have a woman member. They want to see that changed. West Virginia women currently making history include Delegate Amy Summers, the West Virginia House's first lady majority leader. It's very exciting to be part of history and to show that women can serve in the same roles that men can. My father was involved in politics and that's how I got into the system and I had a community that was interested in politics and wanted to see women go far so I had that support. But if someone doesn't have that there are options out there that people can can use to help them. It's important for many reasons. We're half of the population. Uh, we have families. Uh, we have uh, jobs, retirement to think about. There is so much we need to do to be speaking and inputting into the policies and processes that are affecting our lives. In fact, California not only is asking for gender equity on state boards and commissions, but they've just passed a uh, bill, a, a law, into a law uh, to have all corporate boards and commissions be equitable uh, by gender. And so that's very important. We hope that we get uh, to that place as well. These women say it has always been the time, but they see 2019 as a prime time to see women fully engage in government, lead in shaping the political process, and tackle the most important social issues facing West Virginia women. For the legislature today, I'm Randy Yoey. I'm Suzanne Higgins. As we enter the final week of this legislative session, we hope you'll continue to tune in nightly for updates and special programming next Saturday evening, March 9th, as we broadcast live from the Capitol. For everyone here at West Virginia Public Broadcasting, thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great weekend. consistently report that they are more likely to use a service or buy a product from a company that also supports public broadcasting. To become a partner with us in telling West Virginia's story, call our community support staff today. You fill up my One of the most popular singers in America, John Denver. Explore the man behind the music. What Frank Sinatra was to the 40s, Elvis Presley was to the 50s, and the Beatles were to the 60s, John Denver was to the 70s. John Denver, Country Boy. Saturday at 6.30 p.m. Join us for a special screening of the highly anticipated PBS documentary Country Music from award-winning filmmaker Ken Burns. We'll be at the WVU Creative Arts Center in Morgantown at 7.30 Tuesday, April 16th, for an exclusive first look at country music. Plus, our own West Virginia country music treasures, Kathy Matea and Charlie McCoy, will perform live and in person. It's sure to be a big time. Get your tickets at wvpublic.org slash country music. West Virginia Public Broadcasting, telling West Virginia's story. I have never been more proud to be a mountaineer or a citizen of West Virginia.